Hey everybody, welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show here on Reason and Theology. Let's talk about the new document just released by the Vatican, uh, Dignitas Infinita on Human Dignity. This is a declaration released by the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, formerly known as the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, written um, under the supervision of of Cardinal Fernandez. However, it has been in the works since 2019, so not entirely under his supervision, and it seems like it has gone through several drafts. This has been approved by Pope Francis in an audience, so it is authentic magisteria and binding on the consciences of the faithful. So we're going to take a look at the document and then cover some of Cardinal Fernandez's comments about the document that he gave in a press release um, at the Vatican to the press. It has not been entirely translated into English, but I do have some people who uh, sent me an informal translation of the relevant uh, portions that we should consider. So we're going to take a look at those. Well, the document is fairly lengthy, so I don't think that we're going to read the whole thing today. However, we will read a, a very large portion of the document, the most relevant um, paragraphs that you will most likely see discussed in the news. Uh, but since it's pretty lengthy, we're not going to read um, from the presentation all the way unto the end. But I highly recommend that you do. I will put a link to the entire document um, in English in the show notes. It, um, unlike some of the previous documents that have been released recently, this document was immediately made available in German, English, Spanish, French, Italian, and Portuguese. So that's a good thing. Sometimes we've been seeing these documents coming out from the Vatican, and they were only available in Italian with no English translation, and we had to wait a few weeks before we would get those. And so this was helpful. Um, and as a reminder, a declaration um, from the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith is the highest level document that the Dicastery can issue. So these are usually reserved for very, very important teaching moments, doctrinal moments, where the congregation wants to use as much authority as it has to put something forward. Okay. So let me go ahead and share my screen and let's dive in. Like I said, we're going to look at a very large portion of the document and read through a lot of it, um, but not 100%, maybe maybe 75% of the document. Um, so we are going to cover a substantial amount here. Um, so you initially have a presentation section. This is something that we actually saw with Fiducia Supercons, another document released by uh, the same um, Cardinal Fernandez at the Dicastery. So you have a presentation section, and I'm not going to read this whole part. It basically just kind of gives you an overview, not only of the purpose of the document, but it also gives you a history of the drafting of this document. Again, going back to um, March of 2019. So this has, this has really been in the works for a very, very long time. Um, now, if you scroll past the presentation section, you'll come to the introduction. And what I'll do here is give you a summary of each one of these paragraphs um, until paragraph six. Beginning at paragraph seven, we're going to do some some reading, but the first paragraph talks about human dignity and how it remains regardless of circumstances. 
It's something that is created by God and is redeemed by Jesus Christ. But circumstances don't take away from this inherent human dignity that we have. Uh, paragraph two in the introduction section talks about, again, human dignity and how humans deserve respect. So this dignity uh, requires respect on part of others. Paragraph three talks about how the church has often promoted the rights of all and promoted human dignity. Paragraph four talks about various rights, rights to goods, rights to religion, rights to life that people have based on human dignity. Also has a small section there against torture, um, which will be discussed later on in more detail in the document. Paragraph five uh, goes over um, dignity and how it extends to the most defenseless in society. Um, and then paragraph six speaks about inalienable dignity. Now, beginning in paragraph seven, we have a new section of fundamental clarification. And so it wants to define for us what dignity means. And here, I really appreciated this part because there are some helpful distinctions that are made. In fact, um, the document offers a fourfold distinction when it comes to discussing uh, human dignity that I found very productive because often in these discussions, we use these terms somewhat intuitively aware that there are some distinctions here, but our language often doesn't reflect that. And so sometimes we end up talking past each other. So it offers us a very helpful distinction between ontological dignity, moral dignity, social dignity, and existential dignity, which it is going to define for us in paragraph seven and eight, as we will read entirely here. So it's kind of this quadragatic distinction uh, so I was happy to see that. Let's begin at paragraph seven. There is widespread agreement today on the importance and normative scope of human dignity. Let me uh, try to zoom in just a little bit more for you. On the importance and normative scope of human dignity and on the unique and transcendent value of every human being. However, the phrase, the dignity of the human person, risks lending itself to a variety of interpretations that can yield potential ambiguities and contradictions that lead us to wonder whether the equal dignity of all human beings is truly recognized, respected, and protected and promoted in every situation. This brings us to recognize the, the possibility of a fourfold distinction of the concept of dignity, ontological, moral, social, and existential dignity. The most important among these is ontological dignity. So it's going to define that first one for us. That belongs to the person as such, simply because he or she exists and is willed, created, and loved by God. So this is something ontological in nature. It's innate. Um, and it is because God has given this to us. And because he has willed us, created us, and loved us. Ontological dignity is indelible and remains valid beyond any circumstances in which the person may find themselves. So when we speak about ontological dignity, we're talking about something that cannot be lost. That's important. However, it gives you a different kind, another distinction here of human di dignity, and it speaks of a kind that can be lost. Watch this. When we speak of moral dignity, however, we refer to how people exercise their freedom. So there, there's a difference between being what we are and how we exercise how we are. While people are endowed with conscience, they can always act against it. However, were they to do so, they would behave in a way that is not dignified with respect to their nature as creatures who are loved by God, uh, God and called to love others. Yet this possibility always exists for human freedom and history illustrates how individuals, when exercising their freedom against the law of love revealed by the gospel, can commit 
inestimably profound acts of evil against others. Those who act this way seem to have lost any trace of humanity and dignity. So here it's making a really important distinction in this discussion because what I see is a lot of people get tripped up on this distinction because they fail to make it. Some will argue, well, no, you know, human dignity can't be lost. And others will say, but wait, if you commit this act, it's clearly there that person's dignity is lost. Well, they're both true, but we have to make a distinction. Ontological dignity can't be lost. Moral dignity, however, can. And it can be lost based on behavior. This is where the present distinction can help us discern between the moral dignity that de facto can be lost. It acknowledges when we speak of this aspect of human dignity, we can talk about the loss of dignity. There are certain acts, heinous, evil, egregious acts that people could commit. And it's fair to say that person has lost their dignity. While simultaneously, one can also say, but they still retain their human dignity because we're making this distinction between ontological versus moral. And it is precisely because of this latter point that we must work with all of our might so that all those who have done evil may repent and convert. Amen. Right? I feel like, is this a Baptist document? <laughs> I expect to see an amen at the end of this paragraph. Right. So notice this call to repentance and conversion for people who are not living up to their dignity. So, so you see the difference, right? There is this sense in which we always have human dignity. That is, it's innate to us because God has created us and we are made in his image and likeness. There's another sense in which we can lose our dignity by not living up to what we are. Not realizing it in our actions and in our behaviors. And when we fail to realize it, we need to repent. Repentance means turn away. It's, it's a 180. It's a turning away from evil. We need to repent and convert. Turn away from this madness and start to realize the dignity that we have, not only as humans, but especially if we are in Christ Jesus, because at the, as the document is going to note here in a little bit, that image that we have is enhanced and elevated by our participation in Christ. Okay, so now take a look at what it says here in paragraph eight as it continues to... Um, define these distinctions. Now it's going to explain social versus existential dignity. There are still two other possible aspects of dignity to consider, social and existential. When we speak of social dignity, we refer to the quality of a person's living conditions. So now this is something a little bit external, if you will. It's environmental. It's circumstantial. For example, in cases of extreme poverty, where individuals do not have what is minimally necessary to live according to their ontological dignity, food, shelter, water. It is said that those poor people are living in an undignified manner. This expression does not imply a judgment on those individuals, but highlights how the situation in which they are forced to live contradicts their inalienable dignity. So it's referring to a situation. It's not a judgment of them. This is not a judgment on their moral dignity. The last meaning is that of existential dignity, which is the type of dignity implied in the ever-increasing discussion about a dignified life versus one that is not dignified. For instance, while some people may appear to lack nothing essential for life for various reasons, they may still struggle to live with peace, joy, and hope. In other situations, the presence of serious illness, violent family environments, pathological addictions, and other hardships may drive people to experience their life conditions as undignified vis-a-vis, -vis, meaning in relation to, their perception of that ontological dignity that can never be obscured. So 
existential dignity refers to the dignity of how we are existing. These distinctions remind us of the inalienable value of the ontological dignity that is rooted in the very being of the human person in all circumstances. Okay. So it offers us this, again, fourfold distinction, very helpful at the outset, so that we're defining terms, so that we understand what we're talking about in advance, so that there's no confusion. So before we get to the controversial stuff, surrogacy, uh, sex transitions, gender ideology, um, before we get into that stuff, we, we have to define our terms we, we have to understand the basics, and that's what the document is doing here. Now, paragraph 9 talks about um, the human person, and it defines how the person is an individual substance of a rational nature. You've probably heard that before. I, I, I hope so. Um, this is the classical definition of Boethius. I think Boethius was 5th century. If I recall correctly, classical definition, individual substance of a rational nature. Now, notice this part here that is in the definition, rational nature. The document is careful to note that though this is part of the definition, the exercise of rationality is not absolutely required for a person to still have their human dignity. In other words, a person who is in a vegetative state or has not yet attained the age of reason, those persons still have human dignity and still are persons. So you can understand this aspect of this, their rational nature as at the very least potentiality it may not necessarily be an act again there there might be people in a vegetative state so that that rationality they're they're not currently actively using it however that potency is still there um so this is an important uh, distinction that it makes. So let me read this paragraph. Finally, it's worth mentioning that the classical definition of a person as an individual substance of a rational nature clarifies the foundation of human dignity. As an individual substance, the person possesses ontological dignity, that is, at the metaphysical level of being itself. Having received existence from God, humans are subject to subjects who subsist, that is, they exercise their existence autonomously. The term rational encompasses all capacities of the human person, including the capacities of knowing and understanding, as well as those of wanting, loving, choosing, and desiring. It also includes all corporeal functions closely related to these abilities, Nature refers to the conditions particular to us as human beings, which enable our various operations and the experiences that char characterize them. In this sense, nature is the principle of action. We do not create our nature. That, that's important. Uh, and we'll see the implications for that later on when we talk about uh, sex and um, gender. We hold it as a gift and we can nurture, develop, and enhance our abilities. By exercising the freedom to cultivate the riches of our nature, we grow over time. Now watch this key moment here. Even if a person is unable to exercise these capabilities due to various limitations or conditions, nevertheless, the person always subsists as an individual substance with a complete and inalienable dignity. This has a lot of implications morally. And, and again, we're going to see it later on when we get to around paragraph 40 or so. Uh, paragraph 40 to 60 something goes over all kinds of applications for this. This applies, for instance, to an unborn child, which is why we're going to be discussing abortion later on. An unconscious person, right? Or an older person in distress that distress and that will have implications on 
the document's discussion on euthanasia later on. Um, so very important paragraph. Um, paragraph 10 talks about um, our growing in awareness of human dignity, especially in classical antiquity. Paragraph 11 begins to discuss um, human dignity from a biblical angle. And I, I want to read that. I want to read paragraphs 11 and 12. Um, because paragraph 11 and 12 both speak of this uh, from a biblical and also from uh, Jesus' perspective in sacred scripture. So biblical revelation <clears throat> teaches that all human beings possess inherent dignity because they are created in the image and likeness of God. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That's a reference to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27. You'll note, by the way, the scripture references are within the text rather than footnoted at the bottom. So if you look at the bottom, you might not see scripture being referenced there in the end notes. That's because they're in the text. With this, humanity has a specific quality that means it is not reducible to purely material elements. Moreover, the image does not define the soul or its intellectual abilities, but the dignity of man and woman. In their relationship of equality and mutual love, both the man and the woman represent God in the world and also are also called to cherish and nurture the world. This is, this is the concept that Mankind, man and woman, are, are icons of God, if you will. And that's all the more enhanced with the Incarnation. Because of this, to be created in the image of God means to possess a sacred value that transcends every distinction of a sexual, social, political, cultural, and religious nature. Our dignity is bestowed upon us by God. It doesn't come from society. It doesn't come from man. It comes from God. So society and man cannot take it away since it comes from God. It is neither claimed nor deserved. Every human being is loved and willed by God and thus has an inviolable dignity. In Exodus, at the heart of the Old Testament, God shows himself to be the one who hears the cry of the poor. This is something we see all the time in the Old Testament and New Testament. He sees the misery of his people and cares for those who are at least, who are least and for the oppressed. The same teaching can be found in the Deuteronomic Code. Here, the teaching on rights is transformed into a manifesto of human dignity, particularly in favor of the threefold category of the orphan, the widow, and the stranger. You'll see this constantly when you read throughout the Old Testament. The ancient precepts of Exodus are recalled and applied to the moment in the preaching of the prophets who represent the critical conscience of Israel. The prophets Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Micah, and Jeremiah have entire chapters denouncing injustice. Amos bitterly decries the oppression of the poor and his listeners' failure to recognize any fundamental human dignity in the destitute. Isaiah pronounces a curse against those who trample on the rights of the poor, denying them all justice. Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees, or iniquitous decrees and the writers who keep writing oppression to turn aside the needy from justice. This prophetic teaching is echoed in the wisdom literature. For example, Sirach equates the oppression of the poor with murder. To take away a neighbor's living is to murder him. To deprive an employee of his wages is to shed blood. Sirach 3422. In the Psalms, the religious relationship with God comes through the defense of the weak and needy. Do justice for the weak and the orphan. Give justice to the poor and the afflicted. Rescue the weak and the needy. Set them free from the hand of the wicked. Moving forward to paragraph 12, it's going to discuss dignity through the words of Jesus. Born and raised in humble conditions, Jesus reveals the dignity of the needy and those who labor. 
Then throughout his public ministry, he affirms the value and dignity of all who bear the image of God, regardless of their social status. They think of prostitutes and tax collectors and external circumstances. Jesus broke down cultural and cultic barriers, especially by bringing Gentiles into the covenant, restoring dignity to those who were rejected or were considered to be on the margins of society, such as tax collectors, women, children, lepers, the sick, strangers, and widows. He heals, feeds, defends, liberates, and saves. He is described as a shepherd who is concerned about the one sheep that was lost. He identifies with the least of his brethren, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. That's Matthew 25, verse 40. In biblical language, the little ones are not only the children, but are also the vulnerable, the most insignificant, the outcast, the oppressed, the discarded, the poor, the marginalized, the unlearned, the sick, and those who are downtrodden by the powerful. The glorious Christ will judge by the love of neighbor that consists in ministering to the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and the imprisoned with whom he identifies. For Jesus, the good done to every human being, regardless of the ties of blood or religion, is the single criterion of judgment. The Apostle Paul affirms that every Christian must live according to the requirements of dignity and respect for the rights of all people, according to the new commandment of love. So, a biblical summary of dignity Paragraph 13 describes the development of human dignity in history. Paragraph 14 briefly describes human dignity today, you know, in, in current thought, the present era. Paragraph 15 notes how dignity is not conferred, especially by society, and thus always remains intrinsic. A gift from God. Paragraph 16, let's go ahead and read this because it's going to talk about dignity in relation to the Second Vatican Council and the Magisterium. For this reason, the Second Vatican Council speaks of the sublime dignity of the human person who stands above all things and whose rights and duties are universal and inviolable. As the opening line of the Conciliar Declaration Dignitatis Humanae recalls, Contemporary man is becoming increasingly conscious of the dignity of the human person. Remember, this is the heels. It's on the heels of World War II. I mean, World War I, World War II. The Cold War was going on at this time. Um, I think the Cuban uh, Missile Crisis, I think, as well. More and more people are demanding that men should exercise fully their own judgment and a responsible freedom in their actions and should not be subject to the pressure of coercion, but be inspired by a sense of duty. Such freedom of thought and conscience, both individual and communal, is based on the recognition of human dignity as known through the revealed word of God and by reason itself. The church's magisterium, that's the church's teaching authority, progressively develops or developed an ever greater understanding of the meaning of human dignity along with its demands and consequences, until it arrived at the recognition that the dignity of every human being prevails beyond all circumstances. So it was a process. We've always known about human dignity. It's always been there. But we've become more and more aware of it and the implications of human dignity. Okay, uh, paragraph 17 talks about how the church has often promoted human dignity. A paragraph 18 discusses how dignity relates both to body and soul. Both body and soul um, are dignified. Human dignity pertains to both, which will have some implications later on, again, with the uh, sex surgery um, discussion. Now, we're going to read paragraphs 19 through 22. Uh, let's go to this section. Christ elevates human dignity. The second conviction follows from the fact that the dignity of the human person was revealed in its fullness when the Father sent his Son. 
who assumed human existence to the full. In the mystery of the Incarnation, the Son of God conferred, confirmed the dignity of the body and soul which constitute the human being. By uniting himself with every human being through his Incarnation, Jesus Christ confirmed that each person possesses an immeasurable dignity simply by belonging to the human community. Moreover, he affirmed that this dignity can never be lost. This is the ontological dignity. By proclaiming that the kingdom of God belongs to the poor, the humble, the despised, and those who suffer in body and spirit, by healing all sorts of illnesses and infirmities, even the most dramatic ones, such as leprosy, by affirming that whatever is done to these individuals is also done to him because he is present in them. In all these ways, Jesus brought the great novelty of recognizing the dignity of every person, especially those who are considered unworthy. The new principle in human history, which emphasizes that individuals are even more worthy of our respect and love when they are weak, scorned, or suffering, even to the point of losing, losing the human figure, has changed the face of the world. It has given life to institutions that take care of those who find themselves in disadvantaged conditions, such as abandoned infants, orphans, the elderly, who are left without assistance the mentally Ill, Ill, people with incurable diseases or severe deformities, and those living on the streets. Paragraph 20. The third conviction concerns the ultimate destiny of human beings. Listen to this. This is important. We're talking about e eternal destiny here. After the creation and the incarnation, Christ's resurrection reveals a further aspect of human dignity. Indeed, the dignity of man rests above all on the fact that he is called to communion with God, destined to last forever. This is a message that our society desperately needs to hear because as important as this life is, as important as what is going on in the world is, as, as important of, as this side of the veil is, we also have to remember Ultimately, our destiny is one that is eternal, and it is to be in communion with God for all eternity. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? If you have everything in this life, if you're rich, you have everything, but for the rest of eternity you're separated from God? We can't forget that is the most important thing. Again, that doesn't mean that we just completely neglect what is going on here in society and in the world. It's a both and. Both and. But sometimes people get so focused on what's going on in the world today. The poor and injustice. They get so focused on that that they completely neglect anything pertaining to eternal destiny. And eternal injustices, and most importantly, offenses against God, not just against man. But it's a both and, right? We, we can't be like those who say, and by the way, I hear this about, this is the perception that some people have about Christians. The Christians are only focused on, you know, afterlife. They don't really care about what's going on today in society. You know, that may be true of some, but that's not authentic Christianity. And that's certainly not true of many Christians. It's a both and. It says, thus the dignity of this life is linked not only to its beginning, to the fact that it comes from God, but also to its final end to its destiny of fellowship with God and knowledge and love of Him. There's this notion in theology, we, we come from God, but then there's a returning back to God. And it's that returning back that so, much, so many people are forgetting today. In light of this truth, St. Irenaeus qualifies and completes his praise of man the glory of God is indeed man, living man, but the life of man consists in the vision of God. That's a reference to heaven. Consequently, this is paragraph 21, the church believes and affirms 
that all human beings created in the image and likeness of God and recreated in the Son, who become man, who became man, I should say, was crucified and rose again, are called to grow under the action of the Holy Spirit, to reflect the glory of the Father in the same image and to share an eternal life. Indeed, Revelation shows forth the dignity of the human person in all its fullness. So what it's saying here is everyone, 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 every single person has this supernatural calling, not just this natural calling, but also a supernatural one to share in Christ and his accomplishments. Christ, who became man, was crucified, died, buried, rose again for our salvation. We're called to participate in that and grow under the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. This is eternal life. And we're all called to share in that eternal life, it notes. This is the gospel. So I, I appreciate this section. I mean, it's 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 great for us to talk about social conditions and injustices in the world, but we also have to keep in mind that there's also an eternal concept and discussion that we need to have, and that is eternal life versus eternal death. And it discusses that here. So let's go to uh, paragraph 22. Let's read this, a commitment to one's own freedom. Um, it speaks about how we have a choice to recognize our dignity. We, we still have that dignity whether we realize it or not, but we do have through our will that ability to either recognize it or, or obscure it. Every individual possesses an inalienable, an intrinsic dignity from the beginning of his or her existence as an ir irrevocable gift. However, the choice to express that dignity and manifest it to the full or to obscure it, again, it is possible to obscure that dignity. To obscure it depends on each person's free and responsible decision. So when we commit atrocious and evil acts, we're obscuring the dignity that God has given us. Some church fathers, such as St. Irenaeus and St. John Damascene, an Eastern father, distinguished between the image and likeness mentioned in Genesis. If you study Eastern Christian thought, you'll be familiar with this. This allowed for a dynamic perspective on human dignity that understands that the image of God is entrusted to human freedom so that, under the guidance and action of the Spirit, the person's likeness to God may grow, and each person may attain their highest dignity. All people are called to manifest the ontological scope of their dignity on an existential and moral level as they, by their freedom, orient themselves towards the good in response to God's love. Thus, as one who is created in the image of God, the human person never loses his or her dignity. Again, talking about that ontological reality. And never ceases to be called to embrace the good freely. At the same time, to the extent that the person responds to the good, the individual's dignity can manifest itself freely, dynamically, and progressively. With that, it can also grow and mature. Consequently, each person must also strive to live up to the full measure of their dignity. In light of this, one can understand how sin can wound and obscure dignity. Yes, sin obscures our dignity. As it is an act contrary to that dignity, yet sin can never cancel the fact that human beings are created in the image and likeness of God. Again, going back to that ontological aspect. So you see this constant dynamic between ontological versus moral. 
In this way, faith plays a decisive role in helping reason perceive human dignity and in accepting, consolidating, and clarifying its essential features. As Benedict XVI pointed out, without the corrective supplied by religion, though reason too can fall prey to distortions as when it is manipulated by ideology. I mean, we see this a lot and with the power of social media and, and the press, right? It has the ability to manipulate people's reason. Or it applied in a partial way that fails to take full account of the dignity of the human person. Such misuse of reason, after all, was what gave rise to the slave trade in the first place. Mm, you hear that? What gave rise to the slave trade? A misuse of human reason, a distortion of reason. In the many other social evils, not least the totalitarian ideologies of the 20th century. So a distorted um, perspective of reason is what led to the slave trade. This uh, distorted ideology that says it is okay to enslave another human being. That's what gave rise to it. Uh, paragraph 23 uh, briefly discusses the Universal Declaration of Rights. Paragraph 24 uh, begins a brief section on unconditional respect for human dignity. Let's read that part. First, while there has been a growing awareness of human dignity, many misunderstandings of the concept still distort its meaning. Some people propose that it is better to use the expression personal dignity and the rights of the person instead of human dignity and the rights of man since they understand a person to be only one who is capable of reasoning you hear that so that's going to then have implications on people who are not capable of reasoning they then argue that dignity and, a right, and rights are deduced from the individual's capacity for knowledge and freedom, which not all humans possess. This is an apologetic for abortion that some people use. Thus, according to them, the unborn child would not have personal dignity. Because again, they're not yet exercising that ability to reason. Nor would the older person who is dependent on others, nor would an individual with mental disabilities. You see the implications here. This is dangerous stuff. So it's defining the difference between those who speak of personal dignity versus those who speak of human dignity. Not the same thing. Personal is more limited in nature and has devastating effects on all kinds of people, which is why we need to speak of human dignity, not personal dignity. On the contrary, the church insists that the dignity of every human person, precisely because it is intrinsic, remains in all circumstances. The recognition of this dignity cannot be contingent upon a judgment about the person's ability to understand and act freely. Otherwise, it would not be inherent in the person, right? Independent of the individual situation and thus deserving unconditional respect. It would then be conditional. Only by recognizing an intrinsic and inalienable dignity in every human being can we guarantee a secure and inviolable foundation for that quality. Without any ontological grounding, the recognition of human dignity would vacillate at the mercy of varying and arbitrary judgments, which is exactly what's going on in society today. The only prerequisite for speaking about the dignity inherent in the person is their membership in the human species, whereby the rights of the person are the rights of man. Are they human? Okay, then they inherently have dignity regardless of their mental capacity their ability to exercise reason are they human then they have dignity um moving forward paragraph 25 talks about how this dignity again doesn't depend on social recognition uh paragraph 26 
discusses a flawed understanding of human freedom. Um, paragraph 27, um, again, is about human dignity and obligations of our dignity. Uh, paragraph 28 briefly discusses dignity in relation to ecology. It's not very long. It's a short paragraph. Um, so our environment um, paragraph 29, dignity in relation to freedom. Paragraph 30 goes over um, how we are not freer when we move away from God. Some people think that freedom means the ability to sin, the ability to move away from God. No, that's not freedom. That's actually limiting your freedom. Uh, freedom is not the ability to sin or disobey God. It's rather the uh, ability to choose the good and to choose God. Uh, so we do not become freer when we disobey God or do those things that are immoral. Rather, it's quite the opposite. So that's paragraph 30. Uh, paragraph 31 talks about removing injustices and how that will promote human freedom and dignity. Paragraph 32 Talks about us working for dignity and how that is still work that remains incomplete. Paragraph 33 um, talks about dignity in relation to countries and how human dignity is not something that countries have the authority to deny to its citizens. Now let's read paragraph 34. Talks about a lot here. In addressing some of the many grave violations of human dignity today, we can draw upon the teachings of the Second Vatican Council, the most recent ecumenical council that we had, 1962 to 1965 is when it was um, convoked, which emphasized that all offenses against life itself, such as murder, it's going to discuss these in detail, by the way, later, murder, genocide, abortion, euthanasia, and willful suicide, among other things, must be recognized as contrary to human dignity. Furthermore, the Council affirmed that all violations of the integrity of the human person, such as mutilation, physical and mental torture, this is Vatican II, undue psychological pressures, also infringe on our dignity. Finally, it denounced all offenses against human dignity, such as subhuman living conditions, arbitrary imprisonment, deportation, slavery, prostitution, the selling of women and children, degrading working conditions where individuals are treated as mere tools for profit rather than free and responsible persons. Here, one should also mention the death penalty. Oh, right. <laughs> it has a section on the death penalty, which some are not happy about. Here one should also mention the death penalty, for this also violates the inalienable dignity of every person, regardless of the circumstances. And that's true. We know doctrinally the death penalty, regardless of circumstances, violates human dignity. However, we also do know that in Catholic teaching, in some instances, though Pope Francis takes the position that today it's inadmissible, but in some circumstances it could be admitted, not because it's not a violation of human dignity, but rather because there is some other thing that must be preserved. Let me give you an example. You have an intruder. They come to you, break into your house, come at you with, with a gun. You have the ability and the right to defend yourself with even lethal force. You should not intend the death of the aggressor. However, the intention should be to stop them. Knowing that, in that process, it might take their life. The intention is to stop them, not kill them. However, you know it may be required to kill them in order to secure your own safety. So there are instances where violating human dignity may be the choice that you have to make to preserve human dignity elsewhere. This is a, an example of it. Self-defense. 
Yes, when you shoot that person who is coming at you, yes, there, there's a there's a sense in which you're violating their human dignity, but it is something that you must do to preserve your own dignity and your own safety. So there are some circumstances where we can violate human dignity because of something else. However, the intention is not uh, to violate their dignity. It's rather the intention is to preserve our own, to secure our own safety. This goes into discussions about the double effect in moral theology. Uh, so that's what Pope Francis is talking about, and that's what this document with Fernandez um, is, is referring to here. In this regard, we must recognize that the firm rejection of the death penalty shows to what extent it is possible to recognize the inalienable dignity of every human being and to accept that he or she has a place in this universe. If I do not deny that dignity to the worst of criminals, I will not deny to anyone. I will give everyone the possibility of sharing this planet with me, despite all our differences. It is also fitting to reaffirm the dignity of those who are incarcerated, who often must live in undignified conditions. Finally, it should be stated that even if someone has been guilty of serious crimes, the practice of torture completely contradicts the dignity that is proper to every human being. Um, paragraph 35, as you can see, is just one sentence here. While not claiming to be exhaustive, the following paragraphs draw attention to some grave violations of human dignity that are particularly relevant. Uh, paragraph 36 gives as an example and focuses on unequal distribution of wealth. Uh, paragraph 37 discusses poverty. Um, beginning at paragraph 38, we have a discussion about war. It says another tragedy that denies human dignity both in the past and today is war. War, terrorist attacks, racial or religious persecution, and many other affronts to human dignity have become so common as to constitute a real third world war fought piecemeal. With its trail of destruction and suffering, war attacks human, attacks human dignity in both the short and long term, while reaffirming the inalienable right to self-defense and the responsibility to protect those whose lives are threatened. We must acknowledge that war is always a defeat of humanity. No war is worth the tears of a mother who has seen her child mutilated or killed. No war is worth the loss of the life of even one human being a sacred being created in the image and likeness of the creator. No war is worth the poisoning of our common home, and no war is worth the despair of those who are forced to leave their homeland and are deprived from one moment to the next of their home and all the family, friendship, social, and cultural ties that have been built up sometimes over generations. I think we know what that's a reference to. All wars, by the mere fact that they contradict human dignity, are conflicts that will not solve problems but only increase them. This point is even more critical in our time when it has become commonplace for so many innocent civilians to perish beyond the confine, confines of a battlefield. Mm. Um, <laughs> again, I think we know that this has... Uh, some direct um, relevance to what's going on right now with Gaza, right? Paragraph 39, therefore, even today, the church cannot but make her own the words of the pontiffs, repeating with Pope um, Paul VI, never again war, never again war. Moreover, together with Pope St. John Paul II, the church please in the name of God and in the name of man, do not kill, do not prepare destruction and extermination for people. Think of your brothers and sisters who are suffering hunger and misery. Respect each one's dignity and freedom. As much now as ever, this is the cry of the church and of all humanity. Pope Francis underscores this by stating, we can no longer think of a war as a solution because it risks its risks will probably always be greater than its supposed benefits. In view of this, it is very difficult nowadays to invoke the rational criteria elaborated in earlier centuries to speak of the possibility of a just war. You know, we have a just war theory going back at least as far back as St. Augustine. 
He says it's very difficult for us to speak of this. Never again war. Since humanity often falls back in the same mistakes of the past, in order to make peace a reality, we must move away from the logic of the legitimacy of war. The intimate relationship between faith and human dignity means it would be contradictory for war to be based on religious convictions. The one who calls upon God's name to justify terrorism, violence, and war does not follow God's path. War in the name of religion becomes a war against religion itself. Paragraph 40 talks about migrants. Migrants are among the first victims of multiple forms of poverty. Not only is their dignity denied in their home countries, but also their lives are put at risk because they no longer have the means to start a family, to work, or to feed themselves. Once they have arrived in countries that should be able to accept them, migrants are not seen as entitled like others to participate in the life of society. And it is forgotten that they possess the same intrinsic dignity as any person. No one will ever openly deny that they are human beings, yet in practice, by our decisions and the way we treat them, we can show that we consider them less worthy, less important, less human. Therefore, it is urgent to remember that every migrant is a human person who, as such, possesses fundamental and alienable rights that must be respected by everyone and in every circumstance. Receiving migrants is an important and meaningful way of defending the inalienable dignity of each human person, regardless of origin, race, or religion. I mean, we're, we're getting to the heart of the document. Um, this is paragraph 41 that we're uh, getting into. We're going to read paragraph 41 to the end of 62, which is basically the end of the document. So we got a lot of reading to do because it's going to talk about all of the hot button topics all of them and apply what we just learned to these topics so uh we we have a bit of ground to cover and then after that i'm going to be covering the press release by fernandez as well as various reactions to the document so stay tuned for that i'm going to take a quick coffee break and I shall be back in just a moment. Hey friends, do you want others to discover why the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus established? And do you want to help people make sense of all the confusion in the Catholic Church today? Help contribute to this mission by supporting Reason and Theology at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. By doing so, you'll also get access to exclusive content for patrons only. Also, if you want to deepen your faith, there are free ebooks and even courses that you can sign up for by visiting reason.podia.com. Have you ever noticed that certain Catholic teachings are classified differently? For example, some are called dogmas and others are called doctrines. And then a denial of one of these teachings might be called heretical, while a denial of another might just be called an error. In reality, there are many classifications to various teachings that may be found in the Catholic Church. In my course, The Theological Notes, I offer a crash course on this system that will prepare you to identify a teaching's classification more easily. And I'll also help you determine what level of assent or adherence you are required as a Catholic to give to a particular doctrine. So, if you would like to take this course, visit reason.podia.com.
All right. Let's get back to it here. Share my screen. And let's uh, move forward to paragraph 41 with human trafficking. Two paragraphs on it, 41 and 42. Human trafficking must also be counted among the grave violations of human dignity. While it is not a new phenomenon, it has taken on tragic dimensions before our eyes, which is why Pope Francis has denounced it. In particularly emphatic terms, I reaffirm here that the trade in people is a vile activity, a disgrace to our societies that claim to be civilized. Exploiters and clients at all levels should make a serious examination of conscience, both in first person and before God. Today, the church is renewing her urgent, urgent appeal that the dignity and centrality of every individual always be safeguarded with respect to fundamental rights as her social teaching emphasizes. She adds that these rights really be extended for millions of men and women on every continent, wherever they are not recognized. In a world in which a lot is said about rights, how often is human dignity actually trampled upon? <laughs> That's interesting, right? <laughs> It's a good point. In a world in which so much is said about rights, it seems that the only thing that has rights is money. <laughs> ah, well said. Okay. For these reasons, the church and humanity must not cease fighting against such phenomenon as the marketing of human organs and tissues, the sexual exploitation of boys and girls, slave labor, including prostitution, the drug and weapons trade, terrorism, and international organized crime, such as the magnitude of these situations and in their toll in innocent lives and they're told in innocent lives that we must avoid every temptation to fall into a declarationist nominalism that would assuage our consciences. We need to ensure that our institutions are truly effective in the struggle against all these scourges. Confronted with these varied and brutal denials of human dignity, we need to be increasingly aware that human trafficking is a crime against humanity. It is it essentially denies human dignity in at least two ways. Trafficking profoundly disfigures the human humanity of the victim, offending his or her freedom and dignity. Yet at the same time, it dehumanizes those who carry it out. Shifting to sexual abuse, paragraph 43 says, the, the profound dignity inherent in every human being and human beings in their entirety of mind and body also allows us to understand why all sexual abuse leaves deep scars in the hearts of those who suffer it. Indeed, those who suffer sexual abuse experience real wounds in their human dignity. These are sufferings that can last a lifetime and that no repentance can remedy. Wow. This phenomenon is widespread in society. And it also affects the church and represents a serious obstacle to her mission. From this stems the church's ceaseless efforts to put an end to all kinds of abuse, starting from within. Yeah, right. Right. Starts from within the church. Violence against women. Violence against women is a global scandal that is gaining increasing recognition. While the equal dignity of women may be recognized in words, the inequalities between women and men in some countries remains very serious. Even in the most developed and democratic countries, the concrete social reality testifies to the fact that women are often not accorded the same dignity as men. Pope Francis highlighted this when he affirmed that the organization of societies worldwide is still far from reflecting clearly that women possess the same dignity and identical rights as men. We say one thing with words, but our decisions and reality tell another story. Indeed, doubly poor are those women who endure situations of exclusion, mistreatment, and violence since they are frequently less able to defend their rights. 
Paragraph 45, Pope St. John Paul II recognized that much remains to be done to prevent discrimination against those who have chosen to be wives and mothers. There is an urgent need to achieve real, in, I'm sorry, real equality in every area, equal pay for equal work, protection for working mothers, fairness and career advancements, equality of spouses with regard to family rights and the recognition of everything that is part of the rights and duties of citizens in a democratic state. Indeed, inequalities in these areas are also various forms of violence. He also recalled that the time has come to condemn vigorously the types of sexual violence which frequently have women for their object, and to pass laws which effectively defend them from such violence. Nor can we fail, in the name of the respect due to the human person, to condemn the widespread hedonistic and commercial culture which encourages the systematic exploitation of sexuality and corrupts even the very young girls into letting their bodies be used for profit. I mean, gosh, that's spot on. That definitely describes society today. Among the forms of violence carried out on women, how can we not mention coercive abortions? which affect both mother and child, often to satisfy the selfishness of males. And how can we also how can we not also mention the practice of polygamy? As the Catechism of the Catholic Church reminds us, polygamy is contrary to the equal dignity of women and men. It is also contrary to conjugal love, which is undivided and exclusive. Moving forward to paragraph 46, in this consideration of violence against women, one cannot condemn enough the phenomenon of femicide. On this front, the entire international community must have a coordinated and concrete commitment, as Pope Francis reiterated. Our love for Mary, that's the Virgin Mary, our love for Mary must help us to feel appreciation and gratitude for women, for our mothers and grandmothers who are a bastion in the life in our cities. Almost always in silence, they carry life forward. It is in the silence and strength of hope. It is the silence and strength of hope. Thank you for your witness. But in thinking of our mothers and grandmothers, I want to invite you to combat a scourge that affects our American continent. The numerous cases where women are killed. In the many situations of violence that are kept quiet behind so many walls. I ask you to find against this source of suffering by calling for legislation and a culture that repudiates every form of violence. All right. Now we shift over to the abortion section. Probably the longest paragraph in the document. The church consistently reminds us that the dignity of every human person And I'm sorry, every human being has an intrinsic character and is valid from the moment of conception until natural death. It is precisely the affirmation of such dignity that is the inalienable prerequisite for the protection of a personal and social existence. And also the necessary condition for fraternity and social friendship to be realized among all peoples of the earth. On account of the intangible value of human life, the church's magisterium, the the church's teaching authority, has always spoken out against abortion. In this regard, Pope St. John Paul II writes, Among all the crimes which can be committed against life, procured abortion has characteristics making it particularly serious and deplorable. But today, in many people's consciences, the perception of its gravity has become progressively obscured. Yeah, that's 100% spot on. We've become desensitized to the depravity of abortion. The acceptance of abortion in the popular mind, in behavior, and even in law itself, is a telling sign of an extremely dangerous crisis of the moral sense, which is becoming more and more incapable of distinguishing between good and evil. I'll say 
if we can't say that abortion is evil, then yeah, I think we've lost the ability to s distinguish between good and evil. It says, even when the fundamental right to life is at stake, given such a grave situation, we need now more than ever to have the courage to look the truth in the eye and to call things by their proper name. In other words, start calling abortion murder without use, yielding to convenient compromises or to the temptation of self-deception. In this regard, the reproach of the prophet is extremely straightforward. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, Isaiah 5.20. Especially in the case of abortion, there is widespread use of ambiguous terminology, such as interruption of pregnancy. Yeah, euphemistic language. Make it sound nice. Interruption of pregnancy. That sounds better than, a, you know, murder. Which tends to hide abortion's true nature and to attenuate its seriousness in public opinion. And you know what? It's been pretty effective because, again, I think that many people in society no longer see it as a depraved. Perhaps this linguistic phenomenon is itself a symptom of an uneasiness of conscience. But no word has the power to change the reality of things. Call it what you want. The reality is it is murder. Procured abortion is the deliberate and direct killing by whatever means it is carried out of a human being in the initial phase of his or her existence, extending from conception to birth. Unborn children are thus the most defenseless and innocent among us. Nowadays, efforts are made to deny them their human dignity and to do with them whatever one pleases, taking their lives and passing laws preventing anyone from standing in the way of this. It must therefore be stated with all force and clarity, even in our time, that this defense of unborn life is closely link, linked to the defense of each and every other human right. If you don't get this one right, everything else is going to be put into question. If you can't recognize the dignity of the most innocent among us, I'm quite certain you're going to struggle with recognizing dignity in everyone else. It involves the conviction that a human being is always sacred and inviolable in any situation and at every stage of development. Human beings are ends in themselves and never a means of resolving other problems. Once this conviction disappears, so do solid and lasting foundations for the defense of human rights which would always be subject to the passing whims of the powers that be. The United States really needs to listen up here. In the United States, we pride ourselves on human rights, and yet we attack the rights of the most defenseless among us. Reason alone is sufficient to recognize the inviolable value of each single human life. In other words, you don't have to appeal to the Bible. Appealing to the Bible is great, but you know what? A person who doesn't believe in the Bible is just going to say, ah, you can't appeal to the Bible to tell me about why abortion is wrong. Okay. Reason alone tells you abortion is wrong. But if we also look at the issue from the standpoint of faith, every violation of the personal dignity of the human being cries out in vengeance to God and is an offense against the creator of the individual. In this context, it is worth recalling St. Teresa of Calcutta's generous and courageous commitment to the defense of every person conceived. Now, wow, okay. That was well said. We now talk about surrogacy. Uh, let's see, three paragraphs before we get to euthanasia and assisted suicide. 
The church also takes a stand against the practice of surrogacy, through which the immensely worthy child becomes a mere object. On this point, Pope Francis's words have a singular clarity. The path to peace calls for respect for life for every human life, starting with the life of the unborn child in the mother's womb, which cannot be suppressed or turned into an object of trafficking. You see what he's saying? Surrogacy turns human life into an object of trafficking, human trafficking. In this regard, I deem deplorable the practice of so-called surrogate motherhood, which represents a grave violation of the dignity of the woman and the child based on the exploitation of situations of the mother's material needs. A child is always a gift and never the basis of a commercial contract. Ooh. Consequently, I express my hope for an effort by the international community to prohibit this practice universally. First and foremost, the practice of surrogacy violates the dignity of the child, he says. Or the document says. Indeed, every child possesses an intangible dignity that is clearly expressed, albeit in a unique and differentiated way, at every stage of his or her life, from the moment of conception at birth, growing up as a boy or girl, and becoming an adult. Because of this in unalienable dignity, the child has the right to have a fully human and not artificially induced origin. And to receive the gift of a life that manifests both the dignity of the giver and that of the receiver. Moreover, acknowledging the dignity of the human person also entails recognizing every dimension of the dignity of the conjugal union and of human procreation. Considering this, the legitimate desire to have a child cannot be transformed into a right to a child that fails to respect the dignity of that child as the recipient of the gift of life. Paragraph 50, surrogacy also violates the dignity of the woman, whether she is coerced into it or chooses to subject herself to it freely. For in this practice, the woman is detached from the child growing in her and becomes a mere means subservient to the arbitrary gain or desire of others. This contrasts in every way with the fundamental dignity of every human being and with each person's right to be recognized always individually and never as an instrument for another. So now we move over into the uh, paragraphs about euthanasia and assisted suicide. Paragraph 51. There's a special case of human dignity violation that is quieter, but is swiftly gaining ground. It is unique in how it utilizes a mistaken understanding of human dignity to turn the concept of dignity against life itself. This confusion is particularly evident today in discussions surrounding euthanasia. For example, laws permitting euthanasia or assisted suicide are sometimes called death with dignity acts. With this, there is a widespread notion that euthanasia or assisted suicide is somehow consistent with respect for the dignity of the human person. However, in response to this, it must be strongly reiterated that suffering does not cause the sick to lose their dignity which is intrinsically and inalienably their own. Instead, suffering can become an opportunity to strengthen the bonds of mutual belonging and gain greater awareness of the precious value of each person to the whole human family. Certainly, the dignity of those who are critically or terminally ill calls for all suitable and necessary efforts to alleviate their suffering through appropriate uh, palliative care and by avoiding aggressive treatments or disproportionate medical procedures. This approach corresponds with the enduring responsibility to appreciate the needs of the sick person, care needs, pain relief, and effective and spiritual needs. However, an effort of this nature is entirely different from, and is indeed contrary to a decision to end one's own life, or that of another person who is burdened by suffering, even in its sorrowful state. Human life carries a dignity that must always be upheld, that can never be lost, and that calls for unconditional respect. Indeed, there are no circumstances under which human life would cease from being dignified and could, as a result, be put to an end. 
Each life has the same value and dignity for everyone. The respect of the life of another is the same as the respect owed to one's own life. Therefore, helping the suicidal person to take his or her own life is an objective offense against the dignity of the person asking for it, even if one would be thereby fulfilling the person's wish. We must accompany people towards death, but not provoke death or facilitate any form of suicide. Remember that the right to care and treatment for all must always be prioritized so that the weakest, particularly the elderly and the sick, are never rejected. Life is a right, not death, which must be welcomed, not administered. And this ethical principle concerns everyone, not just Christians or believers. As mentioned above, the dignity of each person, no matter how weak or burdened by suffering, implies the dignity of us all. Now it talks about the marginalization of people with disabilities. One criterion for verifying whether real attention is given to the dignity of every individual in society is the help given to the most disadvantaged. Is the help given to the most disadvantaged? Regrettably, our own time, our time, is not known for such care. Rather, a throwaway culture is increasingly imposing itself. To counter this trend, the condition of those experiencing physical or mental limitations warrants special attention and concern. Such conditions of acute vulnerability, which feature prominently in the Gospels, prompt universal questions about what it means to be a human person, especially starting from the condition of impairment or disability. The question of human imperfection also carries clear sociocultural implications. Since some cultures tend to marginalize or even oppress individuals with disabilities, treating them as rejects. However, the truth is that each human being, regardless of their vulnerabilities, receives his or her dignity from the sole fact of being willed and loved by God. Thus, every effort should be made to encourage the inclusion and active participation of those who are affected by frailty or disability in the life of society and the church. In a broader perspective, it must be remembered that this charity, which is the spiritual heart of politics, is always a preferential love shown to those in greatest need. It undergirds everything we do on their behalf. To tend to those in need takes strength and tenderness, effort and generosity in the midst of a functionalistic and privatized mindset that inexorably, uh, inexorably leads to a throwaway culture. It involves taking responsibility for the present with its situations and utter marginalization and anguish and being capable of bestowing dignity upon it. It will likewise inspire intense effort to ensure that everything be done to protect the status and dignity of the human person. Okay, now we get to some very controversial stuff. The section on gender theory, we have about five paragraphs here. And then sex change. So this is the kind of stuff that, you know, makes the headlines here. The church wishes, first of all, to reaffirm that every person, regardless of sexual orientation, ought to be respected in his or her dignity and treated with consideration. While every sign of unjust discrimination is to be carefully avoided, particularly any form of aggression or violence. For this reason, it should be denounced as contrary to human dignity, the fact that in some places, not a few people are imprisoned, tortured, or even deprived of the good of life solely because of their sexual orientation. So, as the Pope has often said, certain sexual acts are sinful, However, the question of um, the security of a person, the dignity of a person, the right to life, it's a different question. He says persons are not to be imprisoned, tortured, or even deprived of the good of life solely because of their sexual orientation. At the same time, the church highlights that the definite critical issues present in gender theory 
On this point, Pope Francis has reminded us that the path to peace calls for respect for human rights in accordance with the simple yet clear formulation contained in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whose 75th anniversary we recently celebrated. These principles are self-evident and commonly accepted. Regrettably, in recent decades, attempts have been made to introduce new rights that are neither fully consistent with those originally defined nor always acceptable. They have led to instances of ideological colonization in which gender theory plays a central role. The latter is extremely dangerous since it cancels differences in its claim to make everyone equal. Regarding gender theory, whose scientific coherence is the subject of considerable debate among experts, the Church recalls that human life in all its dimensions, both physical and spiritual, is a gift from God. This gift is to be accepted with gratitude and placed at the service of the good. Desiring a personal self-determination, as gender theory prescribes, apart from this fundamental truth that human life is a gift, amounts to a concession to the age-old temptation to make oneself God. Entering into competition with the true God of love revealed to us in the gospel. It's uh, connecting the dots here to idolatry. Another prominent aspect of gender theory is that it intends to deny the greatest possible difference that exists between living beings, sexual difference. This foundational difference is not only the greatest imaginable difference, but is also the most beautiful and most powerful of them. In the male-female female couple, this difference achieves the most marvelous reciprocities. It thus becomes the source of that miracle that never ceases to surprise us, the arrival of new human beings in the world. In this sense, Respect for both one's own body and that of others is crucial in light of the proliferation of claims to new rights advanced by gender theory. This ideology envisages a society without sexual differences, thereby eliminating the anthropological basis of the family. It thus becomes unacceptable that some ideologies of this sort which seek to respond to what are at times understandable aspirations manage to assert themselves as absolute and unquestionable, even dictating how children should be raised. It needs to be emphasized that biological sex and the sociocultural role of sex, gender, can be distinguished but not separated. You hear that? Listen to that. Sex and gender can be distinguished but not separated. People in society today are trying to separate those. They say maybe biologically you were born a male, but your gender is what you desire to be. So if you desire to be a female or you believe you're a female, then you're a female because there's a difference between biological sex and gender. And the church says, no, these can't be separated. You could distinguish yeah, you can distinguish between how a person feels or what they desire versus what they biologically are, but you can't separate them. Therefore, all attempts to obscure reference to the ineliminable sexual difference between man and woman are to be rejected. We cannot separate the masculine and the feminine from God's work of creation, which is prior to all our decisions and experiences and where biological elements exist which are impossible to ignore. Only by acknowledging and accepting this difference in reciprocity can each person fully discover themselves, their dignity, and their identity. You know, I think a lot of times with this gender theory stuff, there is a struggle. People are trying to... Um, understand their dignity and identity. And in other words, what this is saying is you will find your dignity and identity in embracing how God has created you, how God has made you. Now, 
in reference to sex change again the most um you know the most i, I would say um hot button topic of the document we have paragraph 60 the dignity of the body cannot be considered inferior to that of the person as such the catechism of the catholic church expressly invites us to recognize that the human body shares in the dignity of the image of god such a truth deserves to be remembered especially when it comes to sex change for humans are inseparably composed of both body and soul in this the body serves as the living context in which the interiority of the soul unfolds and manifests itself as it does also through the network of human relationships constituting the person's being the soul and the body both participate in the dignity that characterizes every human moreover the body participates in that dignity as it is endowed with personal meanings particularly in its sexed condition it is in the body that each person recognizes himself or herself as generated by others. And it is through their bodies that men and women can establish a loving relationship capable of generating other persons. Teaching about the need to respect the natural order of the human person, Pope Francis affirmed that creation is prior to us and must be received as a gift. At the same time, we are called to protect our humanity. And this means in the first place, accepting it and respecting it as it was created. You can see where this is going. <laughs> it follows that any sex change intervention as a rule risks threatening the unique dignity the person has received from the moment of conception. That's the mic drop moment from the whole document. That's ground zero. That's that's the part that, you know, is getting the most headlines. Any sex change intervention, as a rule, risks threatening the unique dignity the person has received from the moment of their conception. So, yeah, this is definitely countercultural. I mean, the whole document is countercultural in many ways. This especially, because society is trying to tell us, hey, there's nothing wrong with this. And the church is saying, actually, sex change interventions, these sex change surgeries, are an offense to the dignity that the person has received at the moment of conception. This is not to exclude the possibility that a person with general genital abnormalities that are already evident at birth or that develop later may choose to receive the assistance of healthcare professionals to resolve these abnorm abnormalities. However, in this case, such a medical procedure would not constitute a sex change in the sense intended here. So in other words, people will try to throw out in these discussions, but what about this case where you have this abnormality? That's not what we're talking about. Now to a section I found incredibly timely, and I... I wasn't expecting, but this needed to be said because I've personally experienced it. I've seen many others experience it. Pope Francis has experienced this. Fernandez has experienced it. It needed to be said. A section on digital violence. Yeah. We're talking about problems with social media. Watch this, paragraph 61. Although the advancement of digital technologies may offer many possibilities for promoting human dignity, it also increasingly tends toward the creation of a world in which exploitation 
exclusion, and violence grow, extending even to the point of harming the dignity of the human person. Consider, for example, how easy it is, through these means, to endanger a person's good name with fake news and slander. I love it. Because this is something I've been harping on for a long time. Because I see it being done to Pope Francis, Fernandez, and many others. And I've also experienced it myself. Fake news, slander. I've had people say the most wild things about me. That I'm not married, that I'm living in adultery. People saying slanderous things about my children. I've seen it all. It happens all too often. So I was pretty impressed to see a section on this because it needed to be said. Watch what he says next. On this point, Pope Francis stresses that it is not healthy to confuse communication with mere virtual contact. Indeed, the digital environment is also one of loneliness, manipulation, exploitation, and violence, even to the extreme case of the dark web. Digital media can expose people to the risk of addiction, isolation, and gradual loss of contact with concrete reality, blocking the development of authentic interpersonal relationships. New forms of violence are spreading through social media. I mean, have you thought of social media like this as a form of violence? You will if people start slandering you and your family and attacking you in the most vicious ways. New forms of violence are spreading through social media. For example, cyberbullying. This might be the first time we've seen cyberbullying in a magisterial document. This internet, or the, I'm sorry, the internet is also a channel for spreading pornography and the exploitation of per um, persons for sexual purposes or through gambling. In this way, paradoxically, the more that opportunities for digital connections grow in this realm, the more people find themselves isolated and impoverished in interpersonal relationships. Digital communication wants to bring everything out into the open. Listen to this. People's lives are combed over, laid bare, and bandied about, often anonymously. That was a mic drop moment for me. Don't you see these cowards online creating these fake accounts, hiding behind anonymous accounts, terrorizing people behind the comfort of anonymity, saying things they would never say to a person's face, trying to comb over people's lives and trying to speak about what all is going on in their lives, often with fake news and misinformation and slanderous accusations. Yeah, I'm glad he called these people out. They're despicable. Respect for others disintegrates, and even as we dismiss, ignore, or keep others distant, we can shamelessly peer into every detail of their lives. Such tendencies represent a dark side of digital progress. This is what they've been doing often to Pope Francis, or even Fernandez, as I've documented over and over on this channel. Paragraph 62, in this perspective, if technology is to serve, serve human dignity and not harm it, and if it is, per, it, it is to promote peace rather than violence, then the human community must be proactive in addressing these trends with respect to human dignity. We're going to have to do something to regulate this stuff. This completely untethered, unqualified freedom of speech has never been a Catholic perspective, and we are seeing its effects on society today. We're seeing the underbelly of it, and it's it's bad. It has to be regulated. And it says, and of the promotion of the good, Human, human community must be proactive in addressing these trends with respect to the human dignity and the promotion of the good. We have to ask this completely unqualified 
freedom of speech that exists in, in today's uh, society. And, and I know people will say, well, you know, it is qualified garbage. No, it isn't. It's not qualified. In reality, it's not. In reality, you can get away with anything. And there's almost no potentiality for being held accountable. Almost in, impossible to hold people accountable. Legally. So it says we have to do something to address this. In today's globalized world, the media can help us to feel closer to one another, creating a sense of the unity of the human family, which in turn can inspire solidarity and serious efforts to ensure a moral, I'm sorry, a more dignified life for all. The media can help us greatly in this, especially nowadays when the networks of human communication have made unprecedented advances. The internet in particular offers immense possibilities for encounter and solidarity. This is something truly good, a gift from God. We need constantly to ensure that present-day forms of communication are, in fact, guiding us to generous encounter with others, to honest pursuit of the whole truth, to service, to closeness, to the underprivileged, and to the promotion of the common good. This is something we're completely failing at, and we're going to have to address this more and more and more, and we're going to see the effects of this in society in the coming decades and centuries. We're going to see how bad some of this negativity has been uh, that we find in social media. We're going to see its consequences on society. Um, I was happy to see this. I wish there was more. <laughs> there needs to be a whole document dedicated to this phenomenon, but I'm glad he's calling out these fake anonymous accounts trying to attack and slander people with fake news. We just see this all too often. Okay, so now we have the conclusion, um, paragraph 63 to 66. Um, on the 75th anniversary of the promulgation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Pope Francis reaffirmed that this document is like a master plan from which many steps have been taken, but many still need to be made. And unfortunately, at times, steps backwards have been taken. The commitment to human rights is never finished. In this regard, I am near to all those who, without fanfare, in concrete daily life, fight and personally pay the price for defending the rights of those who do not count. In this spirit, the Church, with the present declaration ardently, urges that respect for the dignity of the human person beyond all circumstances be placed at the center of the commitments of the common good and at the center of every legal system. Indeed, respect for the dignity of each person is the indispensable basis for the existence of any society that claims to be founded on just law and not on the force of power. Acknowledging human dignity forms the basis for upholding fundamental human rights, which proceed and ground all civic coexistence. Each individual and also every human community is responsible for the concrete and actual realization of human dignity. Meanwhile, it is incumbent on states not only to protect human dignity, but also secure the conditions necessary for it to flourish in the integral promotion of the human person. In political activity, we should remember that appearances notwithstanding, every person is immensely holy and deserves our love and dedication last paragraph, even today in the face of so many violations of human dignity that seriously threaten the future of the human family, the church encourages the promotion of the dignity of every human person, regardless of their physical, mental, cultural, social, and religious characteristics. The church does this with hope, confident of the power that flows from the risen Christ, who has fully revealed the integral dignity of every man and woman. This certainly becomes an appeal in Pope Francis's words directed to each of us. I appeal to everyone throughout the whole world not to forget this dignity which is ours. No one has the right to take it from us. The Supreme Pontiff Francis, at the audience granted to the undersigned prefect of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, with the secretary for the doctrinal section of the Dicastery, on the 25th of March of this year, approved this declaration, which was decided at the ordinary session of this Dicastery on the 28th of February of this year, and he ordered its publication. In other words, it is magisterial. So its teachings are binding on your conscience, and you are to respond to it with docility, humility, religious submission of intellect and will. Given in Rome at the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith on the 2nd of April, 2024, the 19th anniversary of the death of Pope St. John Paul II, 
Cardinal Fernandez, and Pope Francis. Um, yeah, a lot going on with this document. As you can see, we covered the bulk of it. We read, you know, maybe 60, 70 percent of it. Highly recommend that you read the whole thing, the paragraphs that we didn't go over, read them. But I did give you a summary of each one of them. Now, what we'll do uh, coming up here in a moment is we will cover some reactions uh, to the document as well as the um, a summary of the press release. Um, given by Cardinal Fernandez um, to the media about the document. Because as this was released, you also had a press release. It was entirely in Italian, but I did get somebody to translate some relevant portions for us. Uh, so I'll perhaps read some of that to you coming up here in a moment. So stay tuned for more. And by the way, uh, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Okay, I'll be back in just a few minutes and uh, we will resume with the final part of the video. Hey friends, do you want others to discover why the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus established? And do you want to help people make sense of all the confusion in the Catholic Church today? Help contribute to this mission by supporting Reason and Theology at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. By doing so, you'll also get access to exclusive content for patrons only. Also, if you want to deepen your faith, there are free ebooks and even courses that you can sign up for by visiting reason.podia.com. Have you ever heard someone say that Pope Francis denied the existence of hell or Pope Francis worshipped an idol in the Vatican Gardens? There are many claims that have been made about Pope Francis for over a decade and many of them are inaccurate. I've set the record straight in my free ebook called Top 10 Lies About Pope Francis Exposed. Get your free copy today by visiting reason.podia.com. Are you a Catholic thinking about converting to Eastern Orthodoxy? Or are you a Protestant discerning whether or not to become Catholic or Eastern Orthodox? If so, I have the book just for you. It's called Answering Orthodoxy and engages all of the arguments that Eastern Orthodox use against the Catholic Church. I respond to all of them. I show that they are in error and in fact they're inconsistent because the things that Orthodox are objecting to are in fact found in their own tradition. So the fullness of the faith can only be found in the Catholic Church. Check out the book right now at shop.catholic.com for your copy today. Okay, let's um, wrap things up here. Um, uh, for Fiducia Supercons, you put out a kind of short catechism on the document. I hope you do it again for this one. Very helpful. Yeah, that's a pretty good, pretty good idea. Yeah. Okay, well, let's see here. Um, let's talk about some reactions before we get to the... Um, press review. I saw ABC um, didn't seem to be very happy with the document. Vatican blasts sex change surgery, surrogacy as threat to human dignity. These kinds of 
titles I'm saying pretty often. Here's another one for, um, from a very different perspective. This is coming from a Catholic media source that's often very, very critical of the Pope. Cardinal Fernandez's Dignitas Infinita condemns abortion, gender theory, but is silent on homosexuality. Well, he talks about it in the press release, but yeah, I will say the document was silent on homosexuality and perhaps would be good if it addressed homosexuality, fornication, masturbation, and many other sexual sins, but um, it didn't. I think probably the reason why is we had a whole document devoted already to homosexuality just recently called Fiducia Supplicans, which I would think this media outlet would already know since they made a huge deal out of it. So, um, you know, since we had a whole document talking about how same-sex acts are sinful, um, again, Fiducia Supplicans makes that very clear. Um, perhaps they just thought that it wasn't necessary. Yeah, it wouldn't have hurt to address it and many other uh, sexual sins, sure. But I think that's probably why. I mean, the most recent declaration was all about that. So I felt that was a cheap shot. But they're known for taking cheap shots at the Pope anyway, this particular outlet. Here's one from a set of a contest priest. Three heresies in dignitas infinitas. So we have the heresy accusation. Of course, it's a uh, baseless accusation. There are no heresies in it. Um, but as you can imagine, they have to try to find something in it that they claim is heretical. No matter how orthodox it is, you can always be uh, sure that people who are very, very critical of the Pope are going to throw out the heresy accusation which Fernandez will be addressing here in a moment as we go through his press release. Here's from another one that's very critical of Pope Francis, a Catholic source. <clears throat> At this press conference for the Vatican's document on human dignity, coming prepared with a copy of the Code of Canon Law, Tucho Fernandez bizarrely starts quoting Canon 752 that religious submission of intellect and will must be given to a doctrine which the Supreme Pontiff, without being asked anything related to it, obviously came prepared for a fight that no none of the journalists cares about. It's always interesting to see the reactions that, that people have to the stuff. That's what they wanted to latch on. Okay. Um, I would say, as we cover the press release here in a moment, that that actually is very relevant to this. But all right, that's one take. Here's another one from a prominent um, philosopher in Catholicism um, who is very, 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 very critical of the Pope and is usually known for his wildly over-the-top comments. Today is D-Day. That's right. Dignity Day. <laughs> I will be studying the new document, but it's rather depressing to see that it opens with a stupendous falsehood. Every human person possesses an infinite dignity, inalienably grounded in his or her very being, which prevails in and beyond every circumstance, state, or situation the person uh, may ever encounter. And then he goes on to say about that, no creature has infinite dignity. That's sheer balderdash. Only God has, or rather is, infinite dignity. And those who participate in Christ's share finitely in his dignity as son of God. Those who rebel against God lose the dignity he intended to give them. He, he didn't read the document, right? He, and he admits that. He, but he's weighing in on it, making himself look foolish because as I showed y'all, the paragraph uh, was a paragraph seven, distinguished between ontological versus moral dignity, something he's failing to do here. So if he had just read a little bit more, he would have been able to save face from this very foolish commentary. Uh, but notice this, by the way. There's a disposition of dissent automatically. The problem is, if you scrutinize a magisterial document with, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, you're starting out with a Protestant mentality, not a Catholic mentality. The Protestant perspective of teaching authority says, 
I will accept the teaching authority only insofar as it agrees with my preconceived notion of what divine revelation teaches. Um, the Catholic perspective is it is the authentic magisterium that has the authority to give us the correct interpretation of divine revelation. So if I come across something in the uh, authentic magisterium that is not a conclusion I would come to, I am to conform my understanding to the magisterium, not the other way around, because we're not Protestants, we're Catholics. Otherwise, those who say, you know what, I don't accept the church's teaching on artificial contraception, or this, or that, or this, and that, there's really no way to combat them, because ultimately... They get to say what they accept and what they don't accept based on what their conscience tells them divine revelation teaches. And it's automatically, again, a non-Catholic ecclesiology that we're resorting to when we do that. So when you see people do this, just note they're not operating with a Catholic ecclesiology when they do this. They are Protestant at the core in Catholic uh, with a veneer of Catholicism to them. So he says, put differently, that which is infinite is literally that which has no limits or definition or end outside itself. But man's dignity is very much tied to his nature and his end. If his dignity were truly infinite, then he would stand in no need of God or of redemption. Again, he admits he didn't read it, but he comes with this very bizarre criticism of something he hasn't yet read. And it doesn't work because the document sufficiently explains what it means and guards against these misunderstandings. Only a fool comments on what he hasn't actually read. This is a fool. So if that's the document's first line, one's confidence deflates, he says. Evidently in recognition of how controversial it will prove to be, Tucho Fernandez lectured the press today on religious submission of intellect and will, even when no one had raised objection yet. He knows what's coming and wants to preempt it with authoritarianism. That sounds pretty Protestant to me. Because that's exactly what I hear from Protestants. So when the church teaches definitively on something, what will they say? Ah, this is authoritarianism. This is the church telling you you have to check your mind at the door. This is not Catholic. There was another um, response from very other end of the spectrum uh, from a group that um, uh, a Catholic group that again is on the other end and they were very upset, very upset with this document. So it seems like people on both ends of the spectrum um, that are usually very critical um, of the church in one way or another, it seems both of them are upset. And you can imagine this other end of the spectrum is very upset about the Pope's comments about um, sex surgeries and gender theory. They're very, very upset about that. They say, they say this um, document speaks of human dignity and human freedom while suppressing their dignity and freedom. That is persons um, who wish to change their, um, uh, their gender. Um, through these sex surgeries. So they seem to be very, very upset. So what I've noticed is pretty much all around, um, you know, outside of the group of people who are um, faithful to the magisterium, um, both um, sides of the dissenting coin are very upset. You know, both, both groups of dissenters, whether they're on the progressive end or the radical uh, traditionalist end, um, both sides to that dissenting coin are not happy here. <laughs> so I think the only ones that are really happy with the document um, are, are going to be those who are, you know, kind of in the middle and are balanced and are um, faithful to the magisterium and submit to it. Um, so those are just some of the reactions that I've noted. There's plenty, plenty more, and I'm sure they um, uh, will continue to come. Um, but I, I think as you can see, any any reasonable person who has sat down and really read the document would have to agree this is a this is a good document. Um, yeah, perhaps there there could be other things that uh, could have been said and 
you know, should have been said stronger, but on the whole, it's a pretty good document. Um, and I, I certainly think that they did better this time than with fiducia supplicans. There, with as I've pointed out often with fiducia supplicans, it's an orthodox doc, document, but there were some points and phrases there that could have been expressed better, articulated better, um, to help cut down on some of the confusion. And it seems like they buttoned up uh, some of those p potentials in this document to help avert some of that. Um, so let me kind of read to you. Um, well, let's first go to Vatican News that gives you a summary of the press release. I'll read that to you, and then I will read to you an informal translation that has been given to me. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. So this is from Vatican News. Cardinal Fernandez, every single person has dignity. The prefect of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, Fernandez, presents the Dicastery's just published declaration. It was supposed to be called Beyond Any Circumstance to emphasize the fact that every man, woman, child born in Italy or Ethiopia and Israel or Gaza, inside or outside of border, in conflict or in peace or in any culture or condition of life, has the same immense and alienable dignity that no war, subordination, or law contrary to human rights, like the laws of certain countries that condemn the crime of homosexuality, can take away or diminish. Um, instead, the title Dignitas Infinita was chosen for the document from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, published today, April 8th, after five years of work to relaunch in a more direct manner, the always impactful message of Christianity, namely, that God loves everyone with infinite love. In other words, the words that Pope St. John Paul II offered to a group of disabled people he met with in Germany during one of his countless trips abroad. Uh, Cardinal Fernandez, the prefect of the Dicastery of the Doctrine of the Faith, revealed the aforementioned details in a press conference Monday. The cardinal was accompanied by the secretary for the Dicastery. Um, now, his comments on Fiducia Subcons. Yes, he commented on Fiducia Subcons at the beginning of this press conference about Dignitas Infinita. Um, not an expected move, but you'll see why here in a moment. The cardinal who provided direct responses to equally direct questions, sometimes ironic and leaving space for personal anecdotes, revealed backstage and details of the dra drafting of this text of high doctrinal value. Like 24 years ago, the document Dominus Iesus, and four months ago, Fiducius of Cons, the Declaration on the Pastoral Sense of Blessings, that introduced the possibility of blessing even irregular couples, including those of same sex. I have a whole playlist about this, so certainly go and check that out. This, he suggested, is an, an issue certainly less central, less important, but still at the heart of Pope Francis, who wanted to broaden the understanding of blessings outside the liturgical context to develop its pastoral richness. He has the right to do so, emphasized Cardinal Fernandez, as he chose to reflect on the dwelling um, on the dwelling on the DDF's latest declaration, Fiducia Supplicans, at the beginning of his intervention to clarify some issues related to the Vatican text, which, according to external surveys, recorded more than 7 billion, with a B, billion views on the internet. Mic drop moment. Fiducia Supplicans got 7 billion views on the internet wow <clears throat> okay while we don't even remember the name of how many documents he says and garnered garnered approval from over 75 percent of those under 35 in italy i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing i don't know when a journal suggested the cardinal seemed defensive about fiducia supplicans the cardinal clarified Watch this and ask yourself, does this sound familiar? If, if, if you watch RT, does this sound familiar to you? 
The reality is that until yesterday, I didn't think of saying anything. But these days, from the Vatican and from outside, they told me we cannot act as if nothing happened, as if we were escaping from reality with all the chaos that has happened. That's why I expanded my speech. The issue of homosexuality was touched upon. I'm sorry, the, the rest of the part that, that's going to sound familiar. They didn't report. I'll give the rest to you here in a moment. The issue of homosexuality was touched upon several times during the press conference, not so much regarding fiducia supercons, but rather dignitas infinita, which exhorts uh, to avoid any unjust discrimination or aggression and violence against homosexual persons, denouncing as contrary to human dignity the fact that in some countries there are those who are arrested, tortured, killed for their sexual orientation. As you recall from what we just read, that was kind of a minor part from the document, very small part of the document. A few sentences. Denouncing violence. We are in favor of decriminalization. There is no doubt, claimed Cardinal Fernandez. A viewpoint already expressed by many bishops, and which the prefect for the dicastery has now reiterated, denouncing violence contemplated at a level, legal level in some countries, or allowed as if nothing were happening. We are facing a big problem in an attack on human rights, he said, expressing his astonishment at, at having read comments from Catholics blessing the laws against gays issued by the military government of a certain country. He said, when I read them, I wanted to die. <laughs> well, welcome to social media, Cardinal Fernandez. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're going through. To those who pointed out that perhaps the catechism of the Catholic Church should be changed, which considers homosexual acts intrinsically disordered, something that, in the opinion of many, would fuel violence against homosexuals, the head of the dicastery replied that intrinsically disordered is indeed a strong expression. It needs to be explained a lot. Perhaps we could find a clear expression. Well, in my opinion, I think it's pretty clear. And yeah, it's strong, but I don't know if you're going to get any clearer than that. Um, if there's a better one, that doesn't compromise the teaching. Okay, sure. But I just don't know if you're going to find one, to be honest. However, he suggested that at the root of this is the intention to reaffirm that the beauty of the encounter between man and woman who can be together and have an intimate relationship from which new life is born is something that cannot be compared with another. Homosexual acts have a characteristic that cannot even remotely reflect that beauty. Wow. Along the same lines, the Cardinal reiterated the rejection of gender theory because it impoverishes a humanistic vision. In this context, he said, the idea of same-sex marriage or the elimination of differences does not seem acceptable. The prefect also responded to some questions about the issue of sex change considered a tendency to create reality that leads the human being to feel omnipotent and think that with his intelligence and will, he is capable of building everything as if there was nothing before him. The seriousness of the issue becomes special when it comes to children undergoing surgical or hormonal treatments. So now we're talking about that whole issue. Their freedom must be enlightened. Their freedom must first be enlightened, he suggests, that the discussion, this, discussing this issue and in the context of children is so serious that it could require its own document altogether. Yeah, you're, you're on to something, Cardinal Fernandez. Go ahead and make that happen. Need a whole document on that one. Make it happen. Yep. I second that motion. As for the issue of abortion recently approved in France as a right in the Constitution, Cardinal Fernandez stated that when a child is growing in the mother's womb, it could be a woman who is developing. So it is about the right of one woman against the right of another woman. That's an interesting uh, point of view. For the church, the primary right is the original one, the right to life. Regarding surrogacy, saying that with this practice the child becomes the object of a desire does not mean not understanding the sensitivity of the person who desires a child of their own, explained the cardinal. But there is an invitation to transcend this desire because we are talking about the dignity of the person which is greater or to develop desires in another direction, for example, through adoption. Once again, Cardinal Fernandez has conveyed the core message of Pope Francis's pastoral approach 
the welcoming of everyone, 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 even those who think differently on issues of sexual sexuality and marriage. The message is not directed solely at a selected minority that accepts everything the church says. Moreover, today's document, he insists, it is focused on a fundamental pillar of Christian teaching and is hoped to have a universal impact because the world needs to rediscover the implications of the immense dignity of the person in order not to lose its way. Cardinal Fernandez stressed that added that added that dig I'm sorry, they looks like they have a typo there. Um, he stressed and added that Dignitatis Infinita, despite being enriched with 113 footnotes ranging from uh, Pope St. Paul VI to Pope Francis, does not aim to be a compendium of things already said, but a tool to gather and consolidate what has been affirmed by the recent popes and synthesize the in innovations offered by the current pope on a fundamental issue of classical and contemporary Christian thought. Regarding Pope Francis's magisterium, the Vatican prefect took the opportunity to offer a clarification. Here, here's a part that should sound familiar to you, right? Because obviously, with my background and my current work, I focus a lot on discussions surrounding the magisterium. So, I read this um, eagerly, um, uh, wanting to find out what, what what Fernandez thought. So, here it is. Some people who used to adore the Pope now say that the Pope should only be listened to when speaking ex cathedra. By the way, I think that's on the syllabus of errors. That, that's one of the errors, right? Isn't that on the syllabus? That unless, unless it's ex cathedra, you can dismiss it. I'm pretty sure that's one of a condemned proposition on the syllabus of errors. He says some people who used to adore the Pope now say that the Pope should only be listened to if he speaks ex cathedra. If it's not so, we can form our own opinion. We've heard this, haven't we? <clears throat> Who else has been speaking about this? Who else has been hammering home the fact that religious submission of intellect and will is owed to non-definitive teachings that are, of course, not at ex cathedra? If it's not so, we can form our own opinion. He says, listen, the Pope will never speak ex cathedra. In other words, Pope Francis is just not going to exercise that authority. He will never want to create a dogma of faith or a definitive declaration. I'm almost 100% sure. So unless something really changes, Pope Francis is not going to be doing that. We believe that in addition to the charism of infallibility, the Pope has the assistance of the Spirit to guide and enlighten the church. What is he saying? He says that there is an assistance of the Holy Spirit to the non-definitive teachings of the papacy. Does that sound familiar to you? Who else has been saying that? Cardinal Fernandez, have you been watching R&T? <laughs> Honest question. <laughs> this sounds very familiar, doesn't it? And watch this part. This part's going to really sound familiar to you. And they betray the oath of obedience to the Holy Father of their ordination. The cardinals, bishops, and priests who treat the Pope as a heretic against the tradition of the church. Mic drop. That's right. Cardinal Fernandez just called out all of the cardinals, bishops, and and priests who have been dissenting against the magisterium and even accusing the Pope of teaching heresy. He called every one of them out right there and says they go against their oath of obedience to the Holy Father at their ordination. Does that sound familiar too? Yep, it should. Because I've been talking a lot about that. Whether it is the uh, profession of faith or whether we are talking about the oath that cardinals take, or the oath of fidelity period to reject magisterial teachings and dissent from them, or to even worse, accuse them of heresy, is to go against that oath. I was I was very pleased to see him say this because it needed to be said by someone other than somebody on YouTube. It needed to come from a cardinal. It really, and it needs to come from others, not just him. It's kind of sad that more bishops and cardinals aren't saying this. Wow. 
That was a mic drop moment. Um, it says, furthermore, if there are those who think that Pope Francis is taking too many steps forward, the Cardinal said, it must be remembered that in many cases throughout history, a Pope has said something different from his predecessor. The most recent example is that of the death penalty that Pope Francis wanted to abolish from the catechism. Well, in fairness, the same critics who accuse the Pope of heresy are also critics of uh, what Pope Francis has said about the death penalty. But I get what he's saying. And as a person who's writing, writing a dissertation on this very subject, I can say, yeah, there, there's a whole lot of instances like this um, where you do have certain kinds of reversals. Uh, however, we do have to distinguish between different kinds of reversals. And that's something that I'll be um, addressing with y'all in great detail when my dissertation is finished. And I turn that into a book for popular consumption. So more on that in the future. But what he's saying here is, is, is very accurate historically. Uh, finally, during the conference, there was a personal memory the Cardinal shared of his time in Buenos Aires when then uh, Fernandez was appointed rector of the Catholic University. I thought everyone was against me, vehement as if I were among wolves, not because they hated me, but because I had changed their plans. I was in a place where I bothered their purposes. In such occasions, we are tempted to blame ourselves, punish ourselves, disappear. One of those days, Arch Archbishop... Bergoglio told me firmly, no, Tucho, or Tuco, I don't know how they pronounce that. Hold your head up and don't let them take away your dignity because they cannot take away your dignity. Although they certainly have been trying to with all these hit pieces they take against them. Thus concluded the Cardinal, I wish this message to be for each one of you. Wow. Well, that pretty much captures the essence of what I was going to read uh, to you from the informal translation. So I'll hold off on that from this stream and perhaps go over that tomorrow. Um, and perhaps there will be a formal translation of his press release, but that effectively gives you um, a summary of it. Wow, there's just so much going on with that press release, with the document. Um, you know, I'm sure we will be seeing more. Uh, coming up in the news, people who are in favor of it, people who are critical of it. And I'll do further engagements um, with those comments that are made about the document as needed. If you come across something you would like for me to comment on, I mean, shoot it my way, reasonetheology at gmail.com. I'll take a look at it. If there's something out there you think I should be aware of, send it to me. I want to remind y'all, hit that subscribe button. Help me grow Reason and Theology. More people need to see the content on this channel. If you believe that, help me reach them by hitting the subscribe button, the like button, commenting. I want to know your thoughts. What do you think about this video? What do you think of the document? What did you think of the press release from what we have in this summary? Do you agree? Do you disagree? If you disagree, why? If you disagree with me and my commentary, why? As long as you're respectful, I'd love to hear from you. I don't mind people disagreeing with me taking different positions is perfectly fine just be respectful that's all i ask and i'd love to hear from you so whether you're critical of the document me whatever i do want to hear from you put it in the comment section um I, i'd love to read some of your comments and i'll try to engage them the best that i can uh as time permits but i hope this was helpful to y'all um and um, like I said, if there's anything else that you want me to comment on with this particular document, send it to me, reasonetheology at gmail.com. And again, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. All right, that's going to do it for this stream. I'm sure more to come. We'll see you later. Hey, friends, do you want others to discover why the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus established? And do you want to help people make sense of all the confusion in the Catholic Church today? Help contribute to this mission by supporting Reason and Theology at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. By doing so, you'll also get access to exclusive content for patrons only. Also, if you want to deepen your faith, there are free ebooks and even courses that you can sign up for by visiting reason.podia.com.